Let's take a look at some of the most common, or at least more common boss mechanics in Final Fantasy XIV. I have compiled 10 different mechanics, how they typically look and how to deal with them and their variants in this video. So let's hop to it. Number 1. Stack Markers Signified by a blinking bright yellow circle with inward pointing arrows, or a line of inward pointing arrows, this indicates that an attack is going to land on the target which spreads its damage equally between all targets within the circle. Typically, this will always kill the target if they take it alone, and sometimes even if they have just one friend to share it with. Simply stand within the circle to assist in sharing the damage so everyone survives. If you are the player with the stack marker itself, it is common courtesy to move into melee range, regardless of your needs, such that the tank and other melee oriented jobs can enter the stack marker while continuing their attack. A notable difference between the two shapes of stack markers is that the line of inward pointing arrows indicate where the line is, and you don't have to stand precisely next to the target as long as you stand on the line. This means that if there are any targets further behind you that, for some reason, shouldn't be part of the stack, like seen in Puppet's Bunker, it may be beneficial to face it away from them. Variant 1. Double Stack Markers Sometimes a boss will dish out multiple stack markers simultaneously. In most situations, these stack markers will also apply some sort of vulnerability debuff that will make participating in both stack markers lethal. So if you are in an 8-man party and see two stack markers, Usually, you want to split the raid evenly between the markers. If, however, the stack marker does not have this vulnerability attribute, then stacking both markers on top of each other is actually same same, since the damage is split equally between all the players just the same. You can see this, for example, in Circus Tower. Note that there is no indicator on whether a stack marker gives such a vulnerability debuff, so if you aren't sure, it is better to err on the side of caution and not stack the stack markers. Variant 2. The Consecutive Stack Marker Signified by multiple stack markers on top of each other, indicates that the attack will involve back-to-back -back consecutive hits. The only difference is that you should stay in the circle until the attack is fully completed, as a single hit taken alone can kill you. Notably, many dragon bosses use this type of stack marker, and they will usually have a weirdly long pause between the first and second blast, so don't be too hasty to move out. The amount of stack markers tend to indicate the amount of hits the mechanic will deal. Variant 3. Tank Stack Markers Indicated by smaller, red inward pointing arrows, as well as red orbs circling the, hopefully, tank's head. The orbs indicate how many players should stack with them, and the damage is scaled in such a way that only tanks should be capable of assisting, and stacking more players than required tends to be detrimental. This is because, usually, if the tank takes the hit alone, the attack does full damage. If the stack indicates that two players are required, and another player steps in, hopefully a tank, then the damage is halved. If a third player steps in, the damage tends to be mostly unchanged. To deal with this stack marker, if you are a tank, make sure you are in it. If you are not a tank, try and give the tank some space so they can stack without killing you. Note that sometimes, for example in Alliance Raids, a tank stack marker can require three players. Number 2. Pillar Soaks or Tower Markers This mechanic is indicated by a telegraph circle of a slightly different color than normal, with a tall pillar in the middle of it. If no one stands in it when it resolves, it will explode for raid-wide damage, and may come with other negative side effects. If enough players stand in it, usually just one, but sometimes indicated by the number of pillars, then this doesn't happen. The exact damage profile of a pillar soak can vary heavily, but the general approach to dealing with pillar soaks is, if you can reach it, do it. Usually, the damage it does is negligible as long as it is soaked correctly, although this can vary in savage content. Number 3. The Dice Mechanic Indicated by a six-sided die, a d6, counting down as the debuff nears the end of its duration. If you're doing something in the exact moment the debuff ends, then you get punished, usually by taking heavy damage and being flung into the air. Doing something includes moving and auto-attacking, meaning the safest way to deal with this mechanic is to untarget everything and let go of all buttons. Typically, dice mechanics do nothing for their duration and only punishes you if you mess up when the count reaches zero. Number 4. 
fire and ice, or rather pyretic and deep freeze. Certain mechanics, usually fiery, will apply a debuff to you after dealing damage called pyretic. This debuff deals damage to you whenever you do anything and typically the damage adds up extremely quickly and can single-handedly kill you if you don't respect it. Like the dice mechanic, auto attacking and moving also counts, so the best way to deal with it is to untarget everything and stop all action until the debuff is gone. The opposite of this is deep freeze and the like. Certain mechanics, usually cold or icy, will punish you if you aren't doing anything when the mechanic strikes. The common punishment is that you are dealt significantly more damage from the mechanic while also being stunned for a while. Often, this stun is also accompanied by a damage over time effect. The most reliable way to deal with this mechanic is to continuously move leading up to the mechanic and continue to move until the damage lands. Some would suggest jumping as an alternative, however, unless you time your jumps frame perfectly, it will lead to frames where you aren't moving between jumps. I should also mention that being in the middle of a cast does not count as doing something. The second boss in Bales' Wall uses a mechanic called Dynamic Sensory Jammer, which sort of combines the dice mechanic with Pyretic, although it only strikes you once for acting during the debuff, but also flings you in the air if you're acting when it ends. It also does not have the dice indicator. The first boss in Snowcloak's Snowdrift attack does slightly more damage and applies a stacking debuff if you aren't moving when it resolves. At enough stacks, it applies deep freeze, but otherwise it is nothing massive. I believe these are the first times you typically experience these types of mechanics. Number 5. Blue and Purple Circles Indicated by… well a blue or purple circle on the floor. If you stand in the circle itself when it resolves, you die. However, if you're not standing in the circle, you get knocked away from the circle as a result. This means that the safest way to resolve this mechanic is to get close to the circle without standing in the circle. The purple circle is a variant that indicates that the knockback of the mechanic is massive and that you should make sure that you have a wall behind you of some sort to avoid falling off the arena. This of course also means that standing up close to the purple circle can be somewhat irrelevant as long as there is a wall behind you. Number 6. Target Order, sometimes also known as Limit Cut. Signified by everyone in the party being marked with a number and after a while the boss strikes each target in order. Often this can be paired with the boss dashing between targets, causing damage if you happen to be on the line between them. While the more complex versions of this mechanic each have unique ways of dealing with them and are usually exclusively found in Savage content or similar. Holmin's Switch contains a 4-man version example of the dashing variant specifically. To deal with this type of mechanic, make sure to spread out such that the boss won't have to dash over anyone to reach you, or if it strikes in a circle or cone, spread out such that the attacks won't overlap if possible. Sometimes, this kind of mechanic's damage is also based on how close you are to the boss, but this is not always the case. Number 7. Proximity Markers Signified by either a circle that pulses out waves or three blue arrows pointing outward with a red glow in the center. Regardless of the appearance, the amount of damage done by the mechanic is proportional to how close you are to the mechanic and often the damage becomes negligible or outright zero at a certain unspecified range. Simply get as far away as possible from the source if you can in these situations. However, if you are the center of such a mechanic, the best you can do is get as far away from your group as you can with the mechanic. Number 8. Spiked Tethers Signified by a weak pinkish spiked beam from the boss to you. When the mechanic is dealt with properly, it turns into a deep purple tether without the spikes. This kind of mechanic is typically resolved by moving away from the target until the tether changes and then staying at that range. While you are free to move further away, doing so will not affect the mechanic anymore. If the mechanic resolves with the spiky tether, you will take a lot more damage and often be served a vulnerability stack or similar, while the purple tether does mild damage and has no other effects attached. Sometimes, the tether stays spiky regardless of how far you run. This simply means that the further you go, the less damage you take, like a proximity marker, but focused on only one player. Notably, there are other types of mechanics that employ the spiky tether marker, where it means something else. But if the tether is from a boss to you, it almost always means run away. And even when used in other types of mechanics, it still usually means run away. 
Number 9. Rotating AOEs Indicated by orange or blue arrows spinning around the boss before the mechanic begins. Exactly how the attack is shaped can vary between bosses, but the attack is almost always performed such that the boss swings where the telegraphs indicate and then turn precisely enough in the direction indicated to strike a new area. Rarely, the attack will move in a flowing motion. However, this does not change how you need to deal with the mechanic at all. Position yourself behind the telegraph in relation to how the boss will turn, such that you can safely step into the spot the boss attacked after the attack resolved. You can repeatedly do this to stay in a safe spot. Note that it is extremely common for these mechanics to at least do a full 360 if it only strikes in front of the boss, and at least a 180 turn if they strike on two sides, so do make sure to follow the spin around. Number 10. Glares or Gazes Signified by a red glaring eye on the source. To deal with this mechanic, you simply have to be looking away from the source at the very moment where the mechanic resolves. That's basically it. You will know such a mechanic has been resolved, usually by seeing the miss or dodge prompt of the attack failing appear. Sometimes this eye can be centered on a player, and should you be the player it is centered on, the best way to do this for the sake of your team is to step behind everyone else, so only the main tank has to look away. Take note that whenever you initiate a new attack or action that requires a target, your character will snap to face them, so be careful when using actions as a glare or gaze mechanic is about to resolve. Variant 1. Glare Stacks this is often a slightly purple or pinkish colored stack marker with a glare or gaze eye in the center. You need to simultaneously deal with it like a stack marker while also respecting the eye in the center by not looking at it. Variant 2. Cone Glares Sometimes the enemy will have the red eye of a glare or gaze mechanic while simultaneously displaying a cone telegraph or sometimes even a circle AOE. In most cases, you only have to respect the red eye if you're standing in the telegraph, meaning that you can choose between stepping out of the AOE indicator or looking away, and you don't have to do both. To finish off, this is of course not an exhaustive list, so if there's any mechanics you feel I should have included, or otherwise feel is also important to learn and understand, please do let me know in the comments. Then we might be able to take another round of more mechanics later down the line. Now, that is all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support me and my channel, you can let the YouTube algorithm know by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, and hitting the bell to get notified when next I post a video. And if you want to give even more support than that, you can also become a member of the channel like these wonderful people here. Fun fact, the Dice Mechanics Dice Indicator was allegedly originally implemented for the Ozma fight in the Weeping City of Ma, because it was far too easy to miss in all the chaos of the fight with no visible indicator. Weirdly, the Dynamic Sensory Jammer was implemented much later and uses a much more subtle indicator despite effectively being more about the Dice Mechanic than the Pyretic Mechanic.